So thank you all for coming here tonight and welcome. My name is Jeremy Jackson. I'll be the moderator for this evening's event. I'm also the director for the Center of the Study of Public Choice and Private Enterprise and an, assist, an associate professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics. And tonight we're thrilled to have with us what I think is going to be a really fun panel discussing the legacy of Mansur Olson. And Mansur Olson is probably not a name that many of you are that familiar with, which is why we've cleverly titled, titled this, Who is Mansur Olson? So hopefully by the end of, the, of tonight, we'll all know a little bit more, and we'll also know a little bit more about the legacy that, that Mansur Olson left um, here at NDSU. So I want to begin by saying a few words about Mansur um, and some notes of biographical information. Mansur Olson was born in Grand Forks, North Dakota on January 22nd of 1932. He grew up on the family farm between Buxton, North Dakota and Climax, Minnesota. He came to NDSU, which was then the North Dakota Agricultural College, to study economics. And while he was in NDSU, he served as student body president and graduated in 1954. After that, he studied philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar before earning his PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1963. Mansur served as a faculty member in the economics department at the Air Force Academy to fulfill an ROTC obligation, and later he took a job as an assistant professor at Princeton University. In the late 60s, he left higher education for a short period of time and served in government as the deputy assistant secretary in the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and in 1969, moved back to higher education, becoming a professor at the University of Maryland at College Park. He stayed there for the remainder of his career until he passed away outside his office in Morrill Hall in 1998. And you'll recognize that we also have a Morrill Hall here at NDSU. His dissertation was published as a book in 1965 with the title, The Logic of Collective Action, Public Goods, and the Theory of Groups, which for most scholars active in public choice, we just refer to it as the logic. Um, while this was likely his best known work, it was hardly his last. He published many papers, several other books. He also served as the president of the Public Choice Society from 1972 to 74, and founded the Center for Institutional Reform and the Informal Sector. He was also well regarded for his work in helping to reform former Soviet states after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and taught and mentored many students over the years. And of course, we're lucky to have two of the former students um, with us here today. Also joining us on the panel, and I'll give more detailed introductions, introductions later, is Frayne Olson, who is one of Mansur's nephews and also on staff here at NDSU. Mansur was also married to his wife, Allison. They had three children, and his son, Severin, is actually here joining us today as well, so it's really nice to have, have some family members here. So thank you for making the effort to come out. And on a more personal note, I, I remember back in graduate school and reading Mansur's work, and the funny thing that I, that I found then, and I, I, I find it now too, is that I, I actually encountered Mansur's work in both my economics classes, which my PhD is in economics, but I, I took a lot of classes in the political science department, and I encountered Mansur's work in both places. His work was, was significant enough to have a big impact on economics, on political science, but even in sociology and some other fields as well. It's even said very often that Mansur, had he not passed away um, at, a, at an early age, his ideas were significant enough that he was definitely in line for the potential getting of a Nobel Prize. And we'll learn more about his work later, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about the things that he did. I want to think more about the legacy that Mansur has right now at NDSU. And much of that has to do with the work um, that he did that really led to the establishment of what are now two, what we call schools of thought in the world of economics. That is public choice economics and new institutional economics. So both of these perspectives are actually part of the foundation of the work that we do at the Center for the Study of Public Choice and Private Enterprise. Our mission is to engage in research and programs to uncover the institutions and policies that make people's lives better off. So public choice is a part of the name of the center and institutions are a part of the mission that we're trying to accomplish. 
When we first started getting going as, as a center uh, around three years ago, we developed some student programs that we still have going on today, and we were trying to, de to, to decide on what we should name them. And I had come to learn that Mansur Olson was one of the former graduates of NDSU and didn't yet know that Frain was, was actually related to Mansur Olson, but we decided that it would be great to honor the legacy of Mansur Olson in naming our reading group the Mansur Olson Scholars. And we did this partly because Mansur had quite a reputation as being an avid reader. And I'll quote a line from one of his colleagues, Mark McGuire. So he once said, to a book, Mansur was, uh, had, oh sorry, to see a book Mansur had read was to see one devoured and awash with black ink marks and scribbles, destroyed in a way as if the reader had been frantic to consume it. He was also known to have a passion for intellectual debates and had a willingness to engage in other people's ideas. Our Mansur Olson scholars do just these two things. They read books and then they meet together to engage in civil dialogue about important matters. Building on the legacy as well, we are now developing a new program to help students become better researchers for public policy. So we're developing a program called the Mansur Olson Fellows. The Fellows is a full program of training and activities that teaches students how to conduct public policy research. So our hope is that these programs will have a lasting impact on students, on our faculty, and on NDSU, and that they'll be a part of the legacy that Mansur Olson leaves at NDSU on into the future. And you know, I can probably keep talking forever, but I don't want to, to hog all of the time. I do want to thank our co-sponsors and hosts. So the Institute for Humane Studies um, helps us put this on, and we also have support from the Chowley Institute for Global Innovation and Growth. I also, of course, want to thank you all for being here because this is a Friday evening. Granted, maybe the weather isn't so great, so it's nice to be warm and cozy inside. But thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panelists for traveling. Thank you to Mansur Olson's family. And we have also, as I understand it, some, some people that were, were with him in school back in the, in the day at NDSU. Um, so thank you all for coming out. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I do want to leave us with one more comment that, that was meaningful as we were conducting our research. And this is from another Nobel laureate, or from a Nobel laureate, Robert Solow. He said this um, after Mansur's passing. Most of us are pretty much alike. Seen one, you've seen them all. Mansur Olson was different, one of a kind. All the more reason that we will miss him. So as we come together to learn more about the life and legacy of Mansur Olson and how he was different. We have three featured speakers. Each of them are going to have a time to give some opening remarks. And after that, we'll transition to a moderated discussion. I have some questions prepared. There's also going to be um, a time for us to take questions from the audience. So be thinking about those. If you do have an, a question, we'll, we'll have, a, they have the, the microphone that we can throw around. Um, but you can also send in questions on Twitter to the hashtag who is Mansur Olson. Hopefully I said that right. Look back. Did I get that right? Who is hashtag who is Mansur Olson? So I'll go ahead and introduce our first panelist, which is Frain Olson. Frain is a faculty member in the Department of Agribusiness and Applied Economics here at NDSU. He also directs the Quinton Burdick Center for Cooperatives and works as a crops economist and marketing specialist for NDSU Extension Services. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in agricultural economics from NDSU, and his doctorate in agricultural economics from the University of, Me of Missouri, and he's the, the nephew of Mansur Olson. So please join me in welcoming Frayne Olson. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you for everybody for coming this evening. Um, my role in this evening's discussion is probably to provide a little bit of uh, background and context from the family's perspective. Um, I will likely share one or two small stories along the way of what Mansur was like as I was growing up. Uh, but it won't, the, just for introductory comments, I'll make this relatively brief. Um, I, I want to give uh, some perspective and background of his, where he came from. Um, so again, he grew up on a, on a farm in eastern North Dakota, just about 50 miles straight north of here. Uh, very humble beginnings. 
Uh, as I have worked with some of the students here at NDSU, in, in particular a couple of the graduate students, one of the things that is, is kind of a common theme is, well, I don't know if I'm really smart enough to do this. I'm from a small town in North Dakota. And my only comeback is, you can do it. Because if you think about Manser and where he began, he literally got his primary education in a one-room schoolhouse. We've got some photos, some family photos that we've shared with, with Jeremy and, and the, the center there. And, and we've got a picture of Manser and my father and his class, the entire school, and I think there was 12 kids. Uh, the joke kind of within the family was, you know, Mansour was probably the only one that got a um, um, Rhodes Scholar that came from a one-room schoolhouse. So even though he had very humble beginnings, he uh, had tremendous drive, he had, had tremendous ambition, he obviously intellectually had some some skills that some of us don't, don't possess, including me. <laughs> He's, he was uh, w heads and shoulders above anything that I can do. But the moral is, you know, you put in the time, you put in the effort. Just because you came from a small community, just because you came from a rural area, doesn't mean that you can't be successful and that you can't make a significant impact on, on the, your community uh, and literally on the world. Um, and it just uh, one more little story that I want to share to start with and get you guys thinking a little bit. Um, one of the other sh stories that my father shared in particular about Manser, and, and this was really when he was um, near graduation at NDSU and had he, one of his advisors or one of his instructors, teachers, had really encouraged him to apply for the Rhodes Scholarship. And, and he came, my, my father told the story, he came home on, on break, because my father was a few years younger, and they were sitting around the kitchen table, and Mansour was explaining about this scholarship and what it meant. And he wasn't really sure he should apply. And, and the big concern for him was there was financial commitment. Yes, there was a scholarship. You could study at Oxford, and there were tuition was, was paid for, and there were some stipends for living. But you still had to get over to England, and you still had to support it financially from other resources. And the concern was, he, he looked at my grandfather and said, you know, I don't know if we can afford this. And, and he almost didn't apply. And my grandfather looked him straight in the eye and said, you write your paper, you apply. If you get it, we'll figure it out. And, you know, obviously the rest led to bigger and better things. So, again, I, as part of my message, if you look at, at part of Mansur's legacy, don't underrate your abilities. Push yourself, push others, have others push you. You can do this. You can have an impact. So with that, I'll, I'll save some more comments for later. I've got a couple of other stories I'd like to share. But with that, I'll hand it over back to Jeremy. Great. Thank you, Frain. Our next speaker is Keith Daugherty. He is a professor of political science at the University of Georgia. He specializes in the institutional design of American politics. His research has spanned topics ranging from voting rules and assembly sizes to explaining why the founders adopted the U.S. Constitution. He is the author of two books, The Calculus of Consent and Constitutional Design and Collective Action Under the Articles of Confederation. His research has been published by Cambridge University Press, the American Science Review, the American Journal of Political Science, and the Journal of Politics. That's just to name a few. He's an associate editor for Public Choice, and has received the Gordon Tullock Award for the best paper by a younger scholar. Professor Doherty received his bachelor's degree in political economy from Tulane University and his doctorate in government and politics from the University of Maryland, where he took classes from Manter Olson. So please join me in welcoming Keith Doherty. If I can pull this off. Gather around while we tell you a story about the logic of collective action. That's not me. That's the way Manser used to talk, or at least I used to pretend that Manser talked. He always had these really catchphrases, uh, like he always talked about the measuring rod of money. And he talked about oh, the first blessing of the invisible hand. And he always had these really cool catchphrases that made you really kind of endeared to him. And he um, always had these kind of very creative ways of thinking about things. And I think he's a real honor 
for North Dakota State University to be connected with somebody who I admire so much. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Logic of Collective Action. This is his first major book. He actually wrote a book prior to this. But this book um, is one of the most cited books in all social sciences. It has over 44,000 citations in Google Scholar. That's a really big, well-rounded book. Um, Jack's going to spend some more time about the rise and decline of nations. And so what uh, Manser would do is he would spend time developing his ideas really carefully and trying to come up with fun, catchy ways that people would read them things. And lots of collective actions just like that. Um, now this is the first Brook-length study of free riding. And free riding is uh, the idea that if you can get the benefits of a collective good without paying the cost, often people will just take the benefits without taking the cost. They won't pitch in, right? And so uh, it, it's a first full-length study of free riding. It doesn't mean that it's actually the first study of free riding. Um, the first to actually recognize uh, free riding might have been somebody like Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, uh, John Stuart Mill a little bit later. But they never wrote treaties on uh, free riding. They just kind of brought it up in passing. Mansur Olson, I think, is the first to write a full book-length treaty. And in addition to, to recognizing this problem and showing how broad it was, um, he also came up with some cool hypotheses like the privileged group hypothesis. This is, you know, again, very catchy phrases that he comes up with, where small groups are more likely to overcome collective action problems than large groups. So think about uh, sugar beet farmers lobbying versus sugar consumers. The sugar beet farmers, they can monitor each other and get each other to uh, work on the lobbying effort. So they're a little bit more successful than the large group. Um, he also uh, had the exploitation hypothesis, where he said that uh, large actors in a collective action problem were also often exploited by the small actors, because large actors, the ones that benefit the most, Right? They're going to contribute for the public good. Uh, so for example, in NATO, the United States makes a lot of contributions to NATO, while Luxembourg, small country, uh, doesn't contribute as much. And he had the byproducts hypothesis, which is individuals often contribute to attain private byproducts of a good, right? not for the good itself. So this is one of his own examples. Um, the American Medical Association is a lobbying organization. He says nobody contributes because of their lobbying efforts. They contribute to get the journal. They contribute to get the health insurance, uh, and they get admissions to uh, educational conferences. And those, are the, those byproducts were incentives to actually get people to contribute. So it's a really fantastic book filled with things like this. And a whole uh, reap of uh, research has come out of this. Um, we've had in international relations studies related to uh, the Middle East and OPEC, and how OPEC countries uh, will f free ride on each other. Uh, political economy of terrorism, different countries getting involved in terroristic uh, reactions. Uh, studies of refugees. We have studies of interest groups, including lobbies. These books that I'm listing right here are all within the, uh, the last 10 years, all actually in the last nine years. We have protest movements, right? Uh, someone's done a study of collective action problems in the civil rights movement. We have the art of protest, protesting in Germany. We have social networks, for environment, um, trade associations, the list goes on and on. So you guys really are lucky because you have this fantastic person who's made this huge contribution uh, to research and, and, and the whole intellectual enterprise in the social sciences. So Jeremy asked me to tell you a little bit my, about my work in this area. I have uh, uh, one book and a bunch of articles where I, I study this stuff. And my book, Collective Action on the Articles Confederation, came out of my dissertation. Um, and Mansur Olson's role was this. I sent him a, kind of a, a, a small little uh, idea about what I wanted to work on and my prospectus. And he wrote back, your proposal defense notes were here when I was in Poland or arriving back. So I wouldn't be able to make either of the dates. But I will try to help later. And, and, and I think that signature says Mansur Olson. I, that big <laughs> scribble around there. Right? Uh, and I couldn't find the other letter. The other letter that he had, which was much more entertaining, was just as long. And it said, I'd be happy to work on your dissertation, but more as a caboose than an engine. And then he <laughs> signed it again in this big you know, area. So he wasn't actually uh, on my dissertation committee. Um, uh, Allison actually gave me some direction on finding an, a historian to help out. But, you know, I did take classes with him, and he was a super great guy. Um, so my work uh, talks about, like, uh, 
the research question is why do states contribute to requisitions under the Articles of Confederation when Olson's theory suggests they shouldn't, right? Um, and what are requisitions? Requisitions are the appropriations of funds or, or soldiers uh, similar to taxes that are unenforced. So we sit down and we say, hey, let's have, let's divide this up according to our state size. Larger states get a bigger chunk. And then we say, let's ask each state to bring in the portion that they're supposed to bring in. And uh, under this system, there's no enforcement mechanism. So the big question is, why would anybody contribute? Well, what's interesting is under the Articles of Confederation, states contributed 53% of the money, of the, uh, of the money that was, uh, the men that were requested, 40% 40, 40 of the money that was requested. So the Articles of Confederation is a failure, but not an absolute failure. And so why did it work at all? And my answer is that states contributed to obtain the private benefits of a joint product. Um, and a joint product is a, is, a, is a good that's both have public not excludable benefits as well as private excludable benefits. It does both the things. And notice how similar that's to Olson's byproduct hypothesis. Right? The byproduct hypothesis is you give something on the side. This is the good actually has both of these uh, components. Now, this is something actually I, I, I got out of uh, Tad, Todd Sandler. Um, and um, I don't know how much detail we want to go into, but uh, Shays Rebellion might kind of give you the idea. So in uh, 1786, uh, a bunch of farmers uh, got pretty mad because they came back from the Revolutionary War and their farms are being foreclosed. And they're being foreclosed because they couldn't work their farms, so they didn't have any income from their farm while they were off of the Revolutionary War. And they actually didn't get paid by the Continental Congress during that time, so they didn't have any money at all. And now people are foreclosing on their homes. So what they did was they started uh, shutting down some court proceedings in Springfield, Massachusetts. Had a little rabble rousing going in Connecticut and nearby New Hampshire. Um, and um, they thought that the state militia was going to be sent out, so they did this crazy thing. Uh, they decided they were going to attack a federal arsenal and supply themselves with cannon and shot and all that. Well, you just can't do that, right? That's like taking a Minuteman uh, missile silo. You just can't allow that to happen. So the federal government, uh, at, the, at the time, the Confederation government, they're meeting in, in uh, New York, they requisitioned the states for uh, 2,040 troops, that's two brigades, and $530,000 to subdue Shays' Rebellion. They sit around the table, they unanimously agree, let's do this. Everybody that's there says, let's do this, let's raise this money, and guess what? With the exception of Virginia, no state had contributed. Right? So there's Mansur Olson's free riding problem. So the other odd thing is, why on earth does Virginia contribute? Well, it turns out, um, and this is just not, you know, if you want to read the book, you can, but this is kind of interesting. Uh, Virginia is actually the state of Virginia, West Virginia, Kentucky, and they lay claim to the entire Ohio Valley. So Ohio, uh, Indiana, the whole, whole bit. And what they actually wanted is they actually wanted to, the, the cover story was that they were raising an army uh, to subdue Indians in the West, the Wabash Indians, and that's actually what they, uh, Virginia was up to. It seemed that they actually didn't want to suppress the rebellion in, in Massachusetts as much as they wanted to contribute to a standing army. Uh, I can show you some evidence where they get some of the, the federal troops under the uh, command of the state militia, uh, and that seems to be their private benefit that they got from that. So anyway, that's some of the things I, I did with it, and I'm hoping that you guys will do some stuff with it as well. So um, this is just one example of the many interesting things that you can do um, within this framework of the logic collective action that Manser created himself. Um, and I think you got this really great opportunity here for the Center of Public Choice and Free Enterprise to, to work through some of these things and come up with some of your own ideas. And so with students like you, I hope his legacy carries on. Thank you, Keith. And next I'll introduce our, our final panelist, which is Jack Heckelman. Jack Heckelman is a professor of economics at Wake Forest University. His primary research interests are at the intersection of public choice and economic history. He has published over 80 papers covering such topics as drafting of the United States Constitution, secret ballot elections, voting by lottery, political business cycles, economic freedom indicators, and institutional sclerosis. Topic that many should be familiar if you've had some experience with reading Olson. So. I'm sure that Jack will say some things about this. He's a two-time winner of the Gordon Tulloch Prize, including being the first ever winner of the Tulloch Prize for the best article in public choice by a younger scholar. 
He was the co-editor of Collective Choice, Essays in Honor of Mansur Olson, and he has served as co-editor of several prominent journals, including Public Choice, the Southern Economic Journal, and the European Journal of Political Economy. He received his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Texas and his doctorate in economics from the University of Maryland, where he also took classes from Mansur Olson. So please join me in welcoming Jack Heckelman. So first off, I just want to thank Jeremy and the center and IHS for supporting this event and great hospitality that we've had um, in the couple of days I've been here so far. And so I've been asked to talk about uh, the, lot, the uh, rise of the nations, sort of Mansur's second major uh, volume, and the work that I've done that's related to this. Uh, so we've heard about the logic of collective action, and the rise of the nations sort of builds on that in a new dimension. So there's a lot of different ideas in this book. I'm going to focus on one in particular that was already mentioned, this idea of institutional sclerosis. So as has already been mentioned by Keith, as developed in the logic of collective action, it's all about free riding and how it's hard for individuals, even though they have the same goal in mind, they're unlikely to work together in pursuit of that common goal because of the problem of free riding. And the logic explains how you can get around that. And one way is with this idea of called selective incentives. Um, that you're going to target benefits that you can only get if you contribute, like a byproduct, or also penalties if you don't contribute. But we have to know who to give the benefits to and who to punish. So that works better in a small group, small group with common interests. What Olson sort of argues in the, in the rise and decline of nations is that it takes time for these events to occur and for groups to form and overcome the free riding problem and figure out how to do that. And the longer an economy is stable, institutions are stable, the easier it is for groups to form and more groups will form and more and more over time. And what Olson is concerned with is how interest groups will actually behave. Up until that point, interest groups were really focused on by political science and not very much by economics. And in the field of political science, interest groups were a very positive thing. They were a way of getting out information to politicians and policymakers that they might not otherwise be able to acquire. Olson's argument was very different, that special interest groups would try to influence policymakers to develop policies that would benefit them, even if it doesn't do benefits to other people. So uh, Olson was always great with these phrases like institutional sclerosis, and the phrase he used for this was concentrated benefits with diffuse costs. Promote some policy that the benefits will come directly to us, but we're not the ones going to bear the costs. We're going to spread that out among everybody else. And if it gets heavily spread out, the other actors that are getting co costs put upon them aren't going to notice it very much and won't react. Okay. So the policies that we're going to put forward are going to benefit us, even if those policies are harmful overall to the overall economy. And so to think about it in sort of the following way, think about the economy like a big pie. And you've got a slice of that pie. And that's, your, that's the wealth that you have. You want to think about maybe expanding the pie so you, so you get more. And one way in which we can expand economic activity is through research and development. And the government is a way of sort of subsidizing research and development, perhaps, through the National uh, Science Foundation or other types of things where you have an idea and you can apply to the government agency to get a grant and help defray the costs. So you don't pay as much of the costs, it'd be more beneficial to you. So you can lobby the government to give a bigger budget to these organizations. And that way there'll be more money available to engage in your R&D. And if R&D is successful, the economy can help to grow. But once that budget has been put forward by the NSF, anybody can apply to it. You can apply, but so can everybody else. So all these organizations will apply, and maybe some of it works out, and the economy grows. But you're the one that bear all the costs of lobbying the government. So instead of taking the time to build your product, you're taking time to lobby the government. So you're bearing the costs, but everybody else is benefiting from your actions. The pie gets bigger, but your slice gets smaller. You may be better off with a small slice of a bigger pie, but you might not be. And what Olson figures is that most interest groups would not engage in this kind of activity to focus on developing policies that will benefit everybody else. Instead, you'll think about what can actually benefit me and me alone. So, for example, the U.S. steel industry, only a few firms involved in that, we could try to figure out ways the government can reduce our costs and everybody else's costs and make us all better off. On the other hand, what can benefit us is reducing competition for our good. 
like, for example, tariffs. Let's put a tariff on steel that comes into the US so it'd be more expensive to buy their steel so customers will come to us instead. We'll benefit. Our profits will go up. Meanwhile, everybody who buys steel is going to be hurt. All their costs will go up. Construction industry, automobile industry, all these other industries, and a lot more people will get hurt than will benefit from this, but we don't care about that. That's them. If the policies are inefficient, the pie is going to shrink, but we've got a bigger slice of that pie. We're getting the benefit of the tariffs, and the costs of the tariffs are borne by everybody else. And also, is going to argue that we're better off, the special interest group is better off, having that larger slice of a smaller pie than they were having the smaller slice of the larger pie. And so he believes that most interest group activity is going to engage in policies that are going to be redistributive in nature and not necessarily growth enhancing. Okay. So this process will continue on and on. And over time, more interest groups will come in play, and they'll all be doing the same kind of activity, and the economy will slow down more and more, and that's the sclerosis part. How does it ever end? Somehow, we have to lose our ability to influence politicians. We can always lobby the government. There's no way to really stop that. But if the government changes, and I don't mean that we have Republicans in office and they're replaced by Democrats, because I can lobby a Democrat as easily as I can lobby a Republican. But if Congress is eliminated and replaced by a military dictatorship, I've lost my avenue of influence. So sort of instability, upheaval, revolution, insurrection, something that actually changes the government institutions and wipes them out and replaces them. Okay. Invasion. Manser was not arguing, as he was, as he was accused of doing, that these are positive things. He wasn't a Jeffersonian in that regard, saying that every, every couple generations we should have a revolution. He wasn't saying that. But one of the positive aspects of that, one of the side effects of that, is it would actually reduce the influence of special interest groups. Now, over time, even if we replace with a military dictatorship, if that's in place for a long period of time, there's the ability for new groups to form and start the process all over again until the military dictatorship down the road gets replaced by something else. Okay? So basically, his theory was saying that when there's stability in the economy and the institutions that are in place, that leads to the formation of interest groups to form. And the more interest groups that form will lower economic growth. That was the theory. And when it came out in the book form, it was caught a lot of people's attention. And people started to test this idea. Is it true? Let's empirically test Manser's idea. Manser was an idea man, if anything else. He wasn't really an econometrician. He, he didn't have a lot of empirical evidence directly. He sort of told stories that were consistent with his viewpoint. But people would, would say, let's get some data and see whether or not this story is true. The problem is, to test this theory, how many interest groups were there in Britain in 1940? We don't know. How many interest groups were there in Finland? in 1960. We really don't know. We do know the last time Finland was invaded. We do know the last time that Germany had its government thrown out and started over again. So what people really did empirically is they looked at the link from stability in institutions to economic growth. Were economies that were stable for long over periods of time, did they actually have lower growth? And the answer was yes. Most studies were supporting Olson in this regard. The problem is the way I saw it when I sort of looked at this literature, is that we're showing that stability leads to lower economic growth, but Olson's story was about why that happens. So this is necessary for Olson's story to be true, but it's not saying Olson has the right mechanism that other people have the wrong mechanism. There's no actually looking at interest groups. And Manser passed away in 1998, I believe. Okay. Um, and I had never done any work in this area. But when this happened, and actually, when I got the phone call about Manser passing, it was actually the day we were going to talk about this work in the class. And I started to think back to my interactions with Manser, and actually how influential he was on my ideas, but I never actually worked on anything directly related to his work. So what I thought to do is I knew of one of my former professors that actually had some data on interest groups for, for a different kind of purpose. And I used the data, which was a count of how many interest groups there were, in 42 different countries in 1970. And so I could link up the countries that had more interest groups, according to this data set, did those countries have lower economic growth or not? And the answer was basically yes. The countries that were more stable and more interest groups show lower economic growth. 
And I think that was the first time it was re empirically reported, showing that a direct connection empirically between interest groups and lower economic growth. But it was only 42 countries, not a lot you can do with the data. Uh, so I had the one paper and I thought, okay, I'm done with this. Um, and actually the reason why I did the paper was to point out a statistical way of trying to take account of the problems involved in this. And people have since cited the paper, but not for the reason that I wrote the paper. They use it as because it showed the relationship between groups and economic growth and didn't care about my methodology whatsoever. Uh, but somebody else had seen the paper who was also a former student at the University of Maryland, Dennis Coates, and got in touch with me and said, let's do a little more work in this area. So we looked at other kinds of things uh, and said, what is the reason why interest groups lower economic growth? And we showed that the reason had to do with reducing investment. But again, with 42 observations, there's not a lot of things I could do with it. And again, I thought we were kind of done with this. But Dennis had a colleague, Bonnie Wilson. And for those of you that are going to be taking part in the Mansur and Olson uh, Scholars Colloquium tomorrow, she'll be leading that. Uh, and together with Dennis and Bonnie and myself, we put together a much larger data set where we had over 100 countries in several different periods of time. We do a lot more of the data. And we showed these results are very strongly robust. That more interest groups form in a more stable society, more interest groups lead to lower economic growth, lead to less investment, and a few other things. Um, since that time, uh, Dennis has moved on to other things and left this project, and Bonnie and I continue to work on this area. And so we're now at the point where we're actually developing some extensions, uh, some new ideas related to Mansur's work, so not just testing his ideas, but building new extensions from his ideas. And so just as one example, uh, there's a set of indices that are out there that people look at measuring the quality of government, what some people refer to as economic freedom. And uh, Jeremy's done some work in this area. Uh, and what we actually uh, argued in, in our paper is that the ability to economic freedom to benefit an economy depends upon the influence of interest groups. So an economy that has a lot of economic freedom without a lot of interest groups does very well. But an economy that has a lot of interest groups, we have so many resources influencing the policy that the benefits of economic freedom are much lessened. Okay. Um, so we're still working on some newer kind of stuff in this area, but that's sort of one of the more recent things we did. Uh, for additional details, there's a handbook of public choice that came out, a two-volume handbook, came out last year. And in volume number one, which is the more important volume because it has my chapter in it, if you want to see additional details, there's a chapter on collective choice. Um, and in the chapter on collective action, it, it begins with the work of collective action that Keith talked about, going through to the rise of collective nations and beyond, and the general literature that's involved in that. So that has more details in there than I really have time to get into. Um, Mansur, just, uh, just make uh, one final comment about Mansur. The, I, I was a student of his. In fact, the very first graduate class I ever took was by Mansur Olson. Uh, he, he taught, um, well, the course was called macroeconomic theory, but basically he taught Mansur Olson Stories 101. <laughs> and, and on the very first day, we learned about the rise and decline of nations. Um, and the way it was sort of developed in at where I went to school at Maryland is that the semester was broken up across different professors. Mansur taught the first two-thirds of that semester. Somebody else taught the last third and the next third of the next semester. And somebody else taught the last two-thirds of that semester. And Mansur was supposed to teach us macro theory, but really didn't. But I found his stuff much more interesting than the professors who actually did teach macro theory. And I was great, grateful that I actually didn't, didn't actually get bogged down in learning macro theory and got exposed to Mansur's Olson stories and his ideas from my very first day of graduate school. So that's my story. So with that, I think we'll transition and, and, and have a little bit of a discussion. And, I'm, I'm learning things today. I didn't realize that, that Jack and I had that in common, that we both went to graduate school to become macroeconomists and then became public choice economists. So that's, kind of, that's kind of fun. Um, but let's start with, with just you know, some, some sort of low-hanging fruit. Let's just hear some of the, the good Mansur Olson stories that you have. So why don't you share with us what's one of your, your, favorite, your favorite memories that you have. Um, and we'll, we'll go to Frayne first to get a a uh, family story. <laughs> All right. Um, so I had a list here, and I want to make sure that I get the, the appropriate one here. Um, 
<laughs> so I guess the one I'm, I will probably start with, and there's a few others that we can talk about later on. Um, I, I guess, you know, when, when you did the, the artwork for the um, theme for this, obviously it was Mansur with the glasses and the beard. So I have to tell just a little bit story, a funny family story about the beard. Um, for a long time, if you look at some of the photos that were older, he was clean shaven. And all of a sudden, the beard appeared, and that became part of his persona, was having the bushy beard. And understand that my grandmother, his mother, uh, hated the beard. No, no, no. She, she absolutely hated it. I, I distinctly remember the first time he came back to the farm for a visit. He, he spent about a week there. And the entire week, all we heard was how ugly the beard was and why he had to shave it off. And it took me many years to try and finally figure out why was that such a contentious thing. He said, no, I'm, I'm keeping it. And every time we turned around, every meal, it was about this stupid beard that she felt she had to shave off. And, and I, it, it took me a while. Actually, my, my father helped explain it to me. But part of it was when she was growing up, um, if you weren't, were not clean shaven, you were a bum. There was, you were, you know, you were on the edge of the economic precipice, right? <laughs> and so in her mind, if you were not clean shaven, you weren't professional. And she understood that he was supposed to be professional because he worked at the university, he was a professor. And this whole idea, this concept, she couldn't reconcile his career path with this beard. But of course, it, later on, it was, that was part of his personality. It was just part of what he did. And I've got a couple others, but that, I'll start with that. And I do, I, I know you've got a question later on. I do want to tie in my um, dissertation work and kind of one of the reasons that I, I went on for graduate school and tied back to Mansur too. So we'll talk about that in a minute. I guess if I have one real story, this, he, Mansur Olson was a special person in addition to being a really brilliant person. He was the kind of guy who'd walk across the halls and he would just get really excited because he knew somebody and he knew everyone. So he, you could just see him walking down the hall, well, hello, uh, well, hello, oh, yes. You know, and then you'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't go to your talk this afternoon. And he goes, oh, well, sorry, you'd be so disadvantaged by missing it, you know. And he would just say some really funny things like that. And one time when I actually was going to go get my PhD, we go to this hooding ceremony, and he was going to go hood another student. And we were trying to get into the Coliseum, and we couldn't figure out how to get in. So Manser and I started going through the basement of this field house, and I swear we were stuck in this basement for like a half hour. We couldn't figure out where to turn or where to go. And as we got lost, he decided, eh, I'm going to do what I like. So he started asking me about my research projects and let me kind of walk around in this basement trying to figure our way out. And every time I get to a corner, he was asking me, well, no, trying to challenge me on another point. And it's like, don't you want to get out of this basement? <laughs> yeah, that's my, so that's my story. It took a long time to get out. Um, so as I mentioned, the very first class I ever took was, was, was with Mansur Olson. And I still remember the exam. And the exam took up for me two blue books. And I went to get my grade the following week. And it turns out he lost one of the blue books. And he was part of the grade. And then again, the other professor that was teaching this, the last third of the, the combined grades um, somehow. But, but because of this, and I guess he felt bad about this, um, my final grade in the course ended up being a B plus plus. And in Maryland, there were no pluses and minuses. It was just a B. Just a B. So I always kind of wanted to ask him, what did I need to do to get to an A minus minus? <laughs> but That's your favorite story. <laughs> I can, I can, at this point, the grades don't matter. But I got called into the carpet about this B grade later on. Yeah, well, that, That's good stuff. So yeah, Frain, you did, you did kind of briefly mention, but yeah, why don't you tell us about how your experience growing up with Uncle Manser, how, how that influenced the work that you're doing now, and, and tell us a little bit too about the, how that relates to the Quinton Burdick Center that you're directing. Absolutely. So um, 
I, as, as Jeremy mentioned, I got my bachelor's and master's degree here at NDSU when I was in ag economics. And my training in the department was very traditional econ, primarily production economics, microeconomics uh, based. And I, I went back and I began farming with my dad and my brother and we did that for many years. And I also worked on a part-time basis or seasonal basis here at the university. And kind of mid-career, uh, I decided, no, you know, this isn't the career path that's going to work for myself and my family. So I decided I was going to mid midlife go back and get my PhD. So I was 41 when I went back for my PhD, and I knew about you know Manser and his his a, a little bit about his work, but never really studied it, never really got into it because it wasn't part of my curriculum. Um, and then when I started looking around at different universities to go for my PhD. Um, I chose the University of Missouri for a couple of particular reasons. Uh, part of it was because they were rebuilding their, their faculty. Um, and one of the things that they were, they were shifting tremendously was going to move away from kind of the neoclassical macroeconomic perspective and bring in a, uh, a set of faculty that were focused on new institutional economics. And one of the things that my father was heavily involved with, as in, in myself as well when I was, when I was growing up, was, was cooperatives, co the um, farmer cooperatives in particular, but also uh, farm organizations, general farm organizations. And a lot of the issues that you brought up in, in the logic, it was, were based off of some of those concepts. So when I was working with my major uh, professor, my advisor, um, he and uh, he was in the economics, ag economics department, and a rural sociolo sociologist did a semester course on logic. That was the textbook, and then we had some additional readings that were, were part of that. And as we were going through that class, um, my advisor pointed out several interesting things tied back into a lot of the things that you had mentioned as far as the groundbreaking thoughts and ideas that went into that. And so when I was trying to think about a, a dissertation topic, um, and I floated, this took a long time to try and zero in on what makes some sense. And it really came down to some of the things that were in logic. Um, so the way my professor presented this was the, the first part of the book, which is really laying out the concepts, was divided kind of into two pieces. There's the macro issues, macro examples, and then there were the micro examples, uh, which were more organizationally based rather than economic, macroeconomic based. And, and his point was a lot of the work that's been done, a lot of the follow-on work that you guys have done, has focused on that macro viewpoint. What, what happens within a national economy? What happens within the global economy? And, and his point, and I guess I will reiterate to, to, to you in the group, very little work has been done or follow-on work has been done at the micro level, at the organizational level. And so when I was thinking about what do I want to, what I want to do, my advisors really pushed me to, to say, look, why don't you look at the free rider problem within smaller organizations? And so actually my dissertation is about um, using selective incentives, or at least ways that organizations have come up with to mitigate or reduce the free rider problem within these small organizations. And I, ta I targeted cooperatives because of my, my background and knowledge. Um, kind of with that or in that area. And we used an agricultural cooperative as the base for that. So all you Aggies in the room, all you Ag guys saying, well, this isn't a, doesn't apply to me, think about any farm organization, any commodity group, or any cooperative that you're involved with, and the, the thoughts and the concepts that are laid out have a significant role to play in how those organizations work. So if you're thinking about this as saying, hey, this is kind of interesting, there's some unique concepts here, there's a whole, in my opinion, a whole area of research looking at the micro level, the organizational level concepts. And very, to my knowledge, very few people have even explored that. Most of it has been at the macro level at the, you know, again, at the U.S. level. Um, so the, the, um, that have a hit, heavy influence. We studied that. Again, I was marking the book just like, <laughs> you know, just like everybody else and trying to make these concepts work. And as I was reading that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll conclude here, but as I was reading that, I, I thought back to a lot of things that my father had said and stories about when, when he was growing up and the activities that my grandfather and his brother and some of the neighbors, all the struggles that they had trying to organize these cooperatives. And, and it, the, the public good that was created was more um, 
um, competitive pricing. So the free rider problem is, you know, look, if, if everybody works together and we, we, we bundle our purchases or bundle our sales, we can try and negotiate or try and influence price because we have a larger, larger number of, 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 of buyers or sellers. And the idea was as long as we work together, we can get these preferential prices. But as soon as the prices or if we form a cooperative to add competitive pressure in the marketplace and prices start to drop, what's the incentive then to continue to, to patronize or to use the co-op? And so then they would fall apart and we'd start the cycle all over again. And that was the concern. So as the, the boys were growing up, there was this movement, and again, it was in the late 1930s, early 1940s. This was at the tail end of the Depression. The farm economy was not in good shape. There was a lot of pressure to figure out how do we, how do we try and improve our well-being and how would you do that as a group? And, and Mansour was actively engaged, as, as, even as a boy, actively engaged in these discussions, trying to understand what were the problems and what were some of the potential solutions. And as I read through the logic and, and the logic of collective action, we started studying in class, I'm hearing all these stories uh, that my dad told about him growing up and some of the challenges they had with the farm organizations and all this. And I know, I know that that had an influence the seeds for some of this were sown very, very young. And, and that, that obviously through his schooling and, and, and work came up with a lot more detail and, and, and filled in all the gaps. But I I'm firmly believe that the seeds for a lot of this began in his youth and listening to my, my grandfather and, and his brother and the neighbors all, all trying to discuss and figure out how do we make this work? How do we try and get people to participate when it's not in my best interest to participate, but it's in the group's best interest. So there's, there's many different layers of influence that he's had, not only as I was growing up, but also now professionally as I've moved in my career. So I just want to share that story as well. So Keith and, and Jack, and I, I really appreciate seeing the, uh, the impressions too, because I feel like I, I'm getting to know Mantor a little bit, bit through that lens, but I'm, Partly as a, as a teacher, I'm kind of interested to know what, what was a typical day in, in Mansur's classroom like. And I can tell from what you have said already that he must have been an engaging professor, and he was probably a little on the funny side. Jack's story was almost a little bit scary, but did he, did he have an intimidation factor too? Did he, was, he, was there ever something about being in his classroom that was scary or intimidating? No, I, my, another professor that looked like Rasputin, and he was very intimidating looking. <laughs> but Mansur, Mansur was very down to earth. Um, and no, there was no intimidation factor. I think the only thing that was intimidating about him is that he was a man of such a stature that you wanted to impress him, right? Uh, and he didn't want to impress him because he came and frowned on you. He came and smiled on you. Uh, and the only intimidating thing was, you know, would he like me? Well, he liked everybody. I don't, you know, everybody knew him. Uh, he was a very bubbly guy. It's funny because all the pictures on the web, you know, he's frowning in Mr. Serious Face. I don't think I ever saw him like that. I, he was always smiling. That's great. Can I just one, one quick follow-up to that? Because when, when he did come to the farm and visit, he loved to debate. So, so the intimidation part of that was just you knew that if he would, he would pull you into debate so fast you didn't even know what hit you. But once you started debating, you knew that you already lost. <laughs> it was just a matter of how long can I hang in there with him before he squashes me? Because I know it's gonna, I know what's gonna happen. It's just to how much, and and so we'd be we'd literally be sitting around the, the table, we'd be visiting, and and he'd bring up a topic, and somebody would make another response, rebuttal, or comment to it. And he says, "Hmm, well, let's 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 discuss that some more." And then he would suddenly go into this, this this this. What are some of the things that might influence and and. And it was more, he just loved to debate. He would always question your thought process. He'd always question you know, why you, you were looking at it through this lens or this particular viewpoint. And it wasn't, it wasn't demeaning. It wasn't condescending in any shape or form. But he, he just really wanted to challenge you, and he wanted to be challenged. So, One other thing, one other thing about Master, even though he, he was not at all intimidating, he wasn't always in the same realm of reality as you were in. Um, he, 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 even, he, he was a big picture kind of guy, but even when you were having some other conversations, other things were going off in his mind to, to, to think about bigger picture issues. 
Um, so um, he so might refer to him being a little absent-minded, perhaps. Um, and so one, one time, since I, since I had taken the, the first class with him, um, in addition to the book, that, the macro book that we were assigned that we didn't actually use, uh, we all bought The Rise and Decline of Nations. And so um, because that was his book, every time a book gets sold, he gets a royalty on it. And I guess he felt a little guilty about getting a royalty for a book he assigns. He actually wrote a check to every student in his class for $2.17, or whatever it was. Um, I, I never cashed the check. I don't know how many people did, so I probably screwed up his checkbook for, for, for years. Um, but uh, two years later, I was his research assistant, actually. And at the time, he was working on another project, building on the logic, building on Rise of the of Nation, applying it to Sweden. It was a very small book he put out um, called How Bright, are the Other, Other, uh, How Bright Are the Northern Lights. And so I actually did research work for that. And so he wanted to give me a signed copy of that. And he, um, he, gave, he was giving me a copy of all his books, basically. He, he already knew that I already, had bought the, I already had the Rise of the of Nation, so he didn't give me that one. So he was going to sign a copy of the Logic of Collective Action and the, and the House How Bright the Northern Lights book. But he wasn't paying very close attention as to which one he was signing. So um, in, the, in the Northern Lights book, he just wrote to Jack Heckelman, Mansur Olson, 1991. But in the logic, thinking he was actually signing the other book, he wrote to Jack Heckelman, thank you for your good thoughts and criticisms, Master Olson, 1991. So I've got this book that was published in 1965, <laughs> two years before I was actually born, where apparently I was able to offer a lot of good comments and criticisms. You were, you were brilliant at an early yeah. age. <laughs> so let's see if we can, can maybe stoke a little bit of con controversy between you. So, and you might end up agreeing about this. But what, what, do you, what do you think would be Manser's greatest contribution? It doesn't have to be the, the, maybe the easily recognizable contribution, but what is, what is Manser's greatest work? What is his greatest contribution? I, I don't think it is controversial. I think the logic is clearly the influence it's had across so many different disciplines. Um, he's, he's an economist, but this had a bigger impact within political science. It had a major impact in, in sociology. Um, the rise and decline of nations um, attracted a lot of attention within economics, much less so outside of that field. And so I, I think the, um, the, the impact on, on various fields that it had and the timelessness of it is here's just the theory of, of free riding, which, is, which occur, occurs in so many different scenarios. And the incentives really haven't changed. Uh, and so it's, it's as influential today as it really was back in the 1960s. Yeah, I would only add that uh, I think he was a big idea guy. So his biggest contributions were, were never the math. It was never the specifics. It was always the big ideas. And uh, I agree the logic of collective action would be the one I'd say is the biggest one. So what, what do you see as maybe of the things that are lesser known, what, what, are, what is the best article that that we as academics aren't citing? What's the, the hidden nugget? OK, I'll give two responses. First, I'll give Manser's response, if he was here. Um, he had sent me an article uh, that he was working on. And remember, I, I saw the letter somewhere where it said, this will be something like you've never seen before. He thought this is going to just turn the world upside down. Um, he, as you mentioned, he had set up this IRIS project. And, and out of the IRIS project, Two researchers there, Steve Knack and um, Phil Kiefer, had put out a very influential paper looking at, um, again, government indices, uh, looking at property rights and things like this, and showing how they affected the economy. And Manser wrote a paper with a couple other people where they built off of that somewhat. It didn't actually get published until 2000, posthumously. And I don't know, it came out in public choice. I don't know whether it got accepted. And there's a long, back in those days, there could be a one to two year lag in, in that journal. Or it bounced around at various journals, and, and, and after he passed away, the other co-authors sent it there, whatever reason. But by the time it came out in 2000, lots of people had been working with these same data. So it, it really didn't catch on the way Manson really thought it was going to and the way he thought it really should. My own perspective, uh, I think an overlooked paper is one he wrote way back when, before the logic. Manson started his career actually as an economic historian, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and he, one of the papers he wrote in 1960. Three, I think it was, uh, in the Journal of Economic History, um, rapid growth as a, as a destabilizing force. 
And this got a lot of attention, lots of citations in the field of history, but hardly anybody within economics. And I think there's a lot of actually important ideas there. They're, they're unrelated to anything he's done since then. But um, I think there are a lot of things that actually still could explain um, some, some impacts uh, in developing world that's happening today. I think, uh, I think one of the, it's not like one of the greatest intellectual achievements, but it's one of the most fun papers. He's got a paper called The South Will Rise Again. Fall again. Uh, and it's, uh, will fall again. And it's uh, the institutional sclerosis argument all applied to the South after the Civil War. And if you want a really fun read to get started on, you know, Mansur Olson, because you don't know who this guy is, look for that one. The, the, the South will fall again. And it's in my reader, so get the reader. <laughs> so you, you've both mentioned some about, or quite a bit about some of the current things that are going on, and in particular, Keith, you, you showed us a, a whole slew of, of books that have, have come out fairly recently, and, and I know that both you and Jack are, are editors of journals as well. I'm curious, from your experience, um, partly as an editor, but just your, your knowledge of the current field, how much is, is Manser's work still being cited today, even though, as you said, some of his biggest works were, were released in the 60s? Um, and, and who are some of these, these main people that are maybe working in this area? And maybe a little bit about that. Um. Mansur is still really important today. I think he's still one of the leading social scientists that anybody would cite in the history of social science. Uh, if you, as an editor, the works that I see the most are in international relations. Um, so this is an environment where there is no enforcement. The states have to cooperate with each other. There's lots of free riding. There's all these kind of interesting mechanisms that make states contribute. You know, they make a Kyoto Accords. They free ride on the Kyoto Accords, and they don't do what they're going to say they're going to do. Um, and uh, so in international relations, it's, it's still quite a booming business. Uh, and I think that would be the one field where I see it's, it's, it's most strong. But I'm seeing mostly from the political science side. Among economists, um, sort of the rise and decline of nations has, has tailed off somewhat in its, in its influence. Uh, but the logic is still very strong. And one area that it's being applied to now is, in new areas, is in, is, uh, in terrorism, explaining how terrorist groups form um, and the person I associate most directly with that, uh, Keith actually mentioned in passing, this guy Todd Sandler, who's at the University of Texas Dallas, uh, does a lot of work on public goods in general, and did a lot of early work on Mansur's uh, uh, work, but now is focusing his attentions on, uh, on terrorist activity. So, like like any economist with ideas, there there are people who have opposing ideas. So I'm curious, what, what do you see as the main criticisms of, of Manser's work? Um, so I'll give you guys some thought time. Because <laughs> you, you, you will uh, answer that question a lot better than I. But um, I, I guess, again, reflecting back on, on log the logic of collective action, some of the things, debates that we had within, within our classes, but also I, I read um, Sadler's work. As, you know, as part of my dissertation work. Um, probably the biggest criticism is the, the, the concepts, I mean, he makes, so Manser makes a conceptual argument, you know, and he draws upon, and he, he did this throughout his career, he drew upon everyday things that people could relate to. And, and probably the biggest criticism is how do you try and empirically test that? I mean, you, Jack, you mentioned that it was very, very difficult within Rise and Decline of Nations to come up with a data set or would somehow quantify these concepts that were laid out. Logically, you read, you read what his description is, and, and he takes you through this elaborate process saying, well, here, you know, if this happens, it's, it's the theoretical argument, but how do you empirically test it? Because the ideas and the concepts are, they're powerful ones, but they're very hard to quantify. They're hard to put a number on. You can't put a price and a quantity and say this is the way it works. And so it really becomes then these conceptual debates about is, what are the underlying assumptions? What are some of the, the core variables that we may have overlooked that might have a strong influence on the result or the outcome? So I, I guess if, if I were to try and put a, a, a criticism, and it's not really much of a criticism, it's just the work he did was extremely difficult to try and quantify. So how do we empirically test to say, did it work or not work? 
or is this a minor degree or is this a major influence? I think one of those criticisms that he got uh, was completely unfair uh, and inappropriate and people who weren't thinking carefully about it. So he wrote this stuff during the Cold War and anybody who was talking about collectives during the Cold War, everybody just assumed, oh, they're kind of some kind of latent socialist or something. And if you really understood what he was talking about, it was turning it on its head. He was showing exactly why you couldn't have this kind of collectivist state, right? In some ways, it, this is a, the antithesis of the whole idea that he's some kind of lefty. And so uh, I, he was always just an empiricist out there or big idea guy trying to understand phenomena. He didn't have an ideological inclination that I could tell whatsoever, right? So, I mean, if, I think if there, his biggest criticism or one of the criticisms I had heard, I think it was just was just false, which, oh, you study collectives, you must be a collectivist. This is just, it didn't have much basis. So being a big picture guy led, led him to two kind of criticisms. One is he didn't focus on the empirical side of, uh, side of things. And the other is he didn't often focus on the details. So um, he would try to come up with a grandiose theme and then sort of give some descriptive stories all over the place. And show wanted to show that it applied like everywhere and people some critics were saying well it applies in maybe a few isolated cases but not right that you can't you can't you're applying it too broadly and he we once responded i get this quote right to the kid with a hammer everything looks like a nail so uh he just he, once he got a certain idea and he did this with the rise in climate nations as well he would put out a case study on how it applies to the Soviet Union, a case study how it applies to Sweden, a case study how it applies to. Um, he wanted his ideas to apply, not to be, well, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It, it really had to apply kind of universally. And maybe he kind of oversold some of the ideas, perhaps a little bit too much. But the, the, the crux of the ideas, I think, are right if maybe some of the institutional details were not quite right. He did a, a case study of, of France and of Germany and Japan to show how it was consistent with the rise in climate nations. But a lot of these details he talked about really were not actually the way it had worked. He got the right ideas, but the, the details were not quite right. And so it let himself open to be attacked by getting the details wrong. The whole story must be wrong. Fix the detail, and the rest of the story does not fall apart. I think with that, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, And we have a mic in a box. <laughs> Very fancy. <laughs> if you speak into it, it will work. <laughs> like this? You have to just hold it up. You can Hello. It. I'm sorry we have to leave, so I'm interrupting. I was a student on the NDAC campus with Marcus and enjoyed his friendship. We weren't so many students as you have today. So we could know just about everybody by the time you finished four years. And he knew everybody. And he was always anxious to meet and visit with everybody. He loved to talk and debate, as you've heard. Today you carry around a backpack with your supplies, whatever you need for the day. Nobody heard of backpacks in my day on the campus. You carried around a stack of books, real books, and you used them every day. But Marcus carried a briefcase. And you know how many people on campus carried a briefcase then? Very few. Maybe some of the uh, professors, and you wondered what they had in that bag. But Marcus's was loaded, and he carried it that way all the time. But he was a good friend. We, he enjoyed the campus, and people there enjoyed him. Thank you for those anecdotes. That's yeah. great to hear. Some, another, another question up front. Well, I met Master Olson about 70 years ago. He was a freshman at NDSU at, and stayed in the Farmers Union Co-op House. His roots were in that kind of a environment. And I was, a, I was a sophomore, and he was a freshman, and we were roommates for three years. So I got to know him reasonably well. 
most industrious student I've ever been associated with. And I've been, been involved in higher education for 40 years of my life. So I can say fairly honestly that aside maybe from a Japanese or a Chinese graduate student, I can't remember anybody that was more diligent, more straightforward, and worked harder than anyone I ever knew. I presume he graduated with a four-point average. I didn't really ever know. <clears throat> but I guess when you look back at those like myself that grew up during the Depression and viewed the institutions that evolved from the economic environment that existed during the Depression, it's not hard to understand where his interests moved because he grew up in a family that was heavily involved in some of the institutions that were, that were created during that period. Uh, I believe his father was on the board of directors of the Farmers Union Grain Terminal Association, and I think at one time was president of that board. And certainly he's, he had been exposed to the need or the, re, uh, the requirements that occurred during the Depression for farmers to survive out here in the great American desert. And uh, so we, we know his roots were well-founded in the kinds of areas that he chose to study and, and develop concepts and theories and, and, and uh, how he developed his, his, his uh, theories. I, after he graduated, <clears throat> I kind of lost contact with him for a number of years, but I was working in DC quite frequently, being on the faculty here at NDSU and traveling for meetings in Washington and I occasionally would call him when he was with ATW. And he would gladly come, have lunch with me. We'd sit and visit and theorize about what was happening in the world. And it was strictly a refreshing experience each time I ex was exposed to his line of thinking and what was happening at that point in time. So I guess I, I treasure some of the relationships that I had with him. Sorry, I wasn't closer with him in the academic world. Uh, I, I moved in a different direction and worked largely on, on uh, economic development around the world. And so I, I guess uh, I've always admired the, the accomplishments that, uh, that he made and the reputation that he brought to the Ag Econ Department that I spent 25 years teaching in. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? So I think we'll go ahead and, and, and wrap things up then, unless there's any others. But uh, I kind of want to be sure to, to ask a question of you in terms of you know, what is the most valuable thing that you would say that, that you learned from Manser? And for those of us who are here today, what do you think would be the lesson that we should take back from what he did? And You guys can start this one. <laughs> I need to think on that one. I think it'd be work hard, never give up. You can do it. I need more time on that one. Uh. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll jump in. I guess I'll springboard off of, off of that. I, you know, what Jeremy, when in the introductions, talked about two of the characteristics that he had extra, I mean, in addition. One of them was obviously a ferocious reader, um, a, a huge degree of curiosity. You know, it, it really bothered him when he couldn't figure something out. And... And the other was tremendous energy. I mean, the, I, I have never met someone that had more focus. When he, as you said, kind of the absent-minded professor, right? When he put his mind to something and was focusing on some issue, the world just disappeared. And, and I, I saw that, an example of that. We were, um, he had come to visit. He was asked to speak at a conference. Um, actually, he was here in Fargo. And, and when we jumped in the car, because he lived about an hour north, jumped in the car, the first thing he said when he got in, he says, you know, 
I, I, I'm, I don't mean to be rude, but I want you guys to have a conversation, but I can't be involved with it because I need to focus on what I'm going to speak, how, how I'm going to, what I'm going to talk about. And he went into that zone and he didn't come out of it until we were in Fargo. And we had a very good, nice conversation, but he just wasn't engaged in it. But so I agree, work hard, um, have an insatiable curiosity. And if you're going to go after something, go after it with everything you've got, and because and, that's what he did. I think one of the most important lessons that I should take away that I never have is how important the big picture is. Because um, again, he was about the big picture, and he didn't sweat the little details. And I think I probably drive my co-authors, Keith and Bonnie, nuts on occasion because I sweat those little details that well, that's not quite right, let's do this other econometric procedure or whatever, and it's something that, that I think is a little bit better but probably nobody else at all cares about. But it just bothers me when it's not exactly precise. And Keith can maybe address whether or not that, how often that's actually useful and how often it really is not useful. Um, but focus more on the bigger picture and not worry about those little details that can get corrected later on. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for coming. There is cookies and coffee and some punch outside. Feel free to mingle, and, and if you have more questions, want to interact with the panel, feel free to come on and talk. And let's let's thank our panelists.